Hi, I'm Michelle Olivier, and you're listening to Hey, I Want Your Job, the podcast that looks at amazing jobs and what it takes to get them. Welcome to Hey, I Want Your Job. And this week, I have somebody who has an amazing job, and she is cooler and more creative and makes way more beautiful things than I ever have or could do, and I think her job is amazing. Tasha, what is your job? (laughs) What is your job title? I am a goldsmith. Um, I usually call myself a goldsmith, and I'm also a jewelry designer as well. And so when you say goldsmith, I think that people like, at some extent, people have like this image of you with a pickaxe <laughs> and a mine, right? <laughs> Out prospecting. So it's hard to be a little bit about like, what does a goldsmith do? Yeah, I always say to people when they ask me what my job is, I always say, I swear it's a real job. Like we actually, we actually do real things. So goldsmiths are also called jewelers. There's a slight difference depending on who you talk to. Um, But basically I do all kinds of jewelry, manufacturing, repair work, um, custom design work, anything jewelry related. I'm your girl. Okay. And is that like for any, so when you say jewelry, and this is as somebody who is a lover of all things jewelry, is do you work with like do you make engagement rings for people do you make fashion jewelry yeah. do you yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean i've been to so, your website so i kind of know the answer <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my background's in fine jewelry um and usually fine jewelry is anything that's done with um gold platinum all all of there's 10 14 18 22 karat gold uh some silver palladium, all the kind of um, fine jewelry metals. And then the stones that I'm predominantly working with would be a lot of diamonds, a lot of, you know, sapphires, emeralds, the precious and semi-precious stones. So my personal background has been in a lot of custom manufacturing. So I've done a lot of engagement rings over the years, all different kinds. Um, there's the, what I call the meat and potatoes of goldsmithing, which is a lot of your repair work. People are always needing ring size soldered together. You need diamond set or new claws put on. Um, I work now for myself, but before I started working for myself, I worked for a really busy studio here in the city and we did, uh, repair work and custom design work for a lot of the, um, there's a lot of chain jewelry stores or, you know, there's a lot of independent owned jewelry stores. A lot of the small towns have a mom and pop jewelry store and they would send us all their repairs and manufacturing. So I do all sorts of stuff, mostly with gold and platinum. Um, I can work with silver as well. And I do, um, but most of my career has been with gold and platinum. So I have kind of a cheeky question that is just a personal one because so Somehow, back in the day when my husband designed our engagement ring, my engagement rings and and our wedding bands, he got talked into using palladium instead Mm -hmm. of platinum because they said it was even harder than platinum. But apparently it is not something that everybody can work with. So every time one of us, and by one of us, I really mean me, manages to break (laughs) something on my ring. It's a thing. And we there's like only two or three jewelers that can work on it, et cetera, et cetera. Can you talk to me a little bit about why that is and where like what kind of training goes in that separates who can work on what kind of metals? Yeah, so I think that's a big the training is a big part of my career that I spend. It's one of the biggest hurdles in my business is explaining to people the difference. Um, the reality is is you can throw a rock and find somebody who's making jewelry, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Right, but there, and there's a big difference between someone who's uh, making earrings at their kitchen table, no shade at all, go for it. I'm all for, I teach classes, I'm all for people who are learning how to make jewelry at whatever skill level they're at, but there's a difference between someone who is um, 
crafting them at their kitchen table on the weekends and someone who's been training and working with an excessive amount of tools for years. Um, it's just a, it's just a different product, right? Sure. Um, so as far as your different metals that you were discussing before, um, once you start getting into soldering, that's usually when there's a bit of a shift from just being a maker into a silversmith or a goldsmith. Once you start soldering things together and you start getting into more of the kind of crazier tools and a little bit more high-end stuff, each metal reacts differently. Each metal has its own property. So when you go to heat it up, like you're going to solder something together, you're sizing a ring, you have to cut it and solder it together. Each metal is going to react differently. Silver, for example, you need to use a much hotter flame and silver kind of, it's a heat transfer. It, it really sucks the heat in. So you have to really heat it, the much hotter flame and kind of heat it all over. Whereas with gold, you can use a smaller flame and you can kind of hit it right on the spot where you want to solder. Um, platinum, sometimes you run into issues with platinum because platinum, um, you need to have the heat like super, super mega hot. That's a real technical jewelry Super mega term. hot, I like that. Okay, super yeah. <laughs> so when I solder platinum, I actually have to wear welding goggles because the flame is so bright and you're staring at it for quite a while. Um, so when you're dealing with platinum and palladium, a lot of time your costs go up because the metal is much more expensive. And then your labor costs go up because your solder is going to be more money. It's just a little bit more labor intensive when you're working with it. So some people either maybe aren't trained in platinum or palladium or possibly don't have the right equipment for it. Um, I do know when you're dealing with very expensive things that are very sentimental to people, there are a lot of goldsmiths that I've met over the years who are just like, I won't do it because they, they're they worried they're going to crack a diamond or melt something or whatever it happens to be, right? Yep. I That that makes total sense. And I, I love that explanation as well about like how there's tears because I do think that I would feel frustrated in your camp that there are so many people who refer to themselves right now as jewelers. And some of them are doing, they are much more what I would consider to be crafters or mm -hmm. even artists. But so like people who make found object jewelry, for example, some of that is very artistic for sure, but they're not a jeweler to my mind, at least. And I would love to hear your thoughts, obviously, because they're not, they're not able to you know, work with the metals at like a goldsmith or silversmith level, they're not able necessarily to like work with stones, like, you know, like you would. So what, where to you is that line between somebody who is just making jewelry that you can wear and yes, has artistic merit and, you know, you should pay them for it, et cetera. And where is made that is like a true jeweler? Yeah. Well, I think everyone deserves to be paid for what they do. I think I that's think a good call. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> And if you are making $20 earrings at your kitchen table, good on you, but you need to raise your prices too. Um, so I think where, where I run into, sometimes where I run into struggles is let's say I don't do a lot of craft shows or trade shows, but let's say I was at a trade show. Here's kind of the reason why I don't, um, is if you have, usually there's a lot of jewelry at those shows. And if you have 10 tables of people who are assembling jewelry, so they're buying pieces off the internet and assembling them together. Um, they can charge $20 for a pair of earrings or $30 for a pair of earrings. Whereas when you get into someone who's using um, gold or sterling silver and you're having to solder things, you're having to hand finish or hand craft things, you can't, you can't charge $20 for it. And like you're not even covering your costs. And right. I think sometimes the consumer struggles with that or doesn't really understand that, which is part of our job is to educate that. Great. There's a big movement in fashion jewelry, which is wonderful. Um, but I find a lot of times, particularly with the, like the millennials or the younger generation, they don't really know the difference between gold plated um, or gold colored jewelry and real gold jewelry. And there's a huge, there's a huge difference, right? If there's a if there's a chain and it's fifty dollars and they're saying it's gold, chances are very slim it's like it's it's not gold, right? Yeah. And there's a not that there's anything wrong with that, but as a consumer, you need to be educated on what you're purchasing and where your money is going, what you're getting, basically. So, 
this is an unlikely comparison, but I do actually understand where you're coming from because there's a similar situation in my industry with there's so many people out there who say I'm a resume writer, I'm a career coach, et cetera. And the answer is like, yes, the technically write resumes. But if you are paying somebody $50 to write your resume, what I always tell people is time is money. And so either they're not spending very much time doing that, which is bad, or their time is not very valuable which also says that they probably don't have the experience and training that you need to have somebody doing the job that you want. And so from like, does that make sense? And people kind of like, wow, I saw on like the thumbtack that somebody was willing to do this for like 60 bucks. I'm like, my friend, if that's what you're looking for, I am not the girl for you. That is a true fact. Yeah. This and I think not the same product. <laughs> it's hard to think that way. I started thinking that way a few years ago i i get it if you don't want to spend a hundred dollars on a pair of earrings then maybe you're just not my people yeah um but it's difficult because you want to make everyone happy and you, and you don't want to turn down sales whenever you can help it but there is that kind of you try to find a balance between the two right of you get what you pay for versus also getting a bit of a deal i see that a lot i see that a lot in high-end jewelry um people travel and take vacations and they come back with jewelry that's, you know, I spent ten thousand dollars on this, and it's 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 falling apart, and and it's the the metal is like I use quotations for metal <laughs> is like peeling off, and like like it's yeah, I see that a lot actually. Well, and I think that like this speaks to, and we were kind of chatting about this before in the in the pregame, as it were, um, about the fact that as professionals in any space, there's always an element of imposter syndrome. Like, like, am I really worth $150 an hour? Oh my God, that's such a huge number to tell me they have to pay me if they want to borrow my brain. And then I think, yeah, I am because my children, as it turns out, like food. And I have been doing this for 20 some odd years. And I think that like that, and then as women, Right. We are also women's work is so undervalued in society at large. And so it's harder for us to stand up and say, this is how much I am worth. And if that is, if my services are not worth that to you, that's okay. I don't wish you ill, but then this is not going to be a good match. Um, but God damn, that's hard, Tasha. <laughs> it is. But have you ever found you quote somebody a price on something and then in your head, you're like, oh, they're never, they're never going to say yes to this. They'll never say yes to this. And then they just like answer you back. Yeah, no problem. I'll take four or whatever. Maybe not I'll take four, but they're, it's not a yeah. problem at all. So it's, it's like your, your inner dialogue is what's messing you up. Well, and I think one of the things that my business partner reminds me of on the regular is that every time, every time I have somebody who negotiates hard on the price, if I budge, that is the person that is the biggest pain in the ass client ever. That's your, and I, mm -hmm. that's like, that is, and because I'm always like, well, they seem so nice. She's like, they always seem nice. They are <laughs> never nice when we're in the weeds with them. And like, she's not wrong. And I think that part of it is that like, I do find with some things that there is an element of just being able to say, you don't have to buy from me and that's okay. That kind of immediately sets the to a tone for the professional relationship with that client. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I think where I used to struggle too is, I mean, I'm from Canada. I'm from the prairies. I'm raised in an environment of like salt of the earth people. Um, so a $50,000 engagement ring was not something that I was brought up with it was oh. not right it, yeah. it was not something you were brought up with but um my life now I've made I've made really expensive jewelry for people before and I used to really struggle there was a bit of a disconnect there for me because maybe it's not something like uh, maybe I wouldn't spend twenty thousand dollars on a pair of earrings um but once I started making it not about me it's not about what I want. It's about what they want. And now I try to approach every relationship by giving value. 
what can I bring to this relationship that's valuable? So when I put that shift in my brain, it made things so much easier. Whether I would buy a $20,000 pair of diamond earrings or not, doesn't really matter. They're gonna do it anyways. If you want a $20,000 pair of diamonds, you're gonna do it whether I'm on board or not, right? Yep. So where I can provide the value is by helping guide you through that process so that you feel confident with the decision that you've made, particularly in engagement rings, where most of the time you have young men who know nothing about diamonds. Um, the biggest purchase up to this point would have been maybe a house, maybe a car. And it's safe to say that most people in general, but let's say men, if we're going to really categorize it here, most of them feel more confident purchasing a car or a home. They feel like they're more knowledgeable in that area. And then when you start throwing diamonds at them, they have no idea what's going on. And they're really, really concerned with being taken advantage of or not her comparing it with her friend's jewelry. So what I can do in that situation is provide value and help guide them through the process so that when they do purchase it, they feel confident with what they've purchased and they feel proud of what they've done. So once you change the transaction to not about me, but about giving value to them, it kind of shifts the whole, the whole buying relationship, if that, that makes, makes sense. sense. One of the things that I find the older I get um, is that some of the pieces, so my husband, and I've been married for kind of a while at this point. Um, and when we made our rings in the first place, palladium was not nearly as expensive as it is now. And you're in this space, so you know way better than I do, but the cost of that has gone just like apparently through the roof. And so when we bought the rings, they were valued at like, I don't know, a few grand. And we were like, oh, that's the expensive thing I have on my hand, but all right. Like, but now they're valued at like, a lot and like I feel intimidated wearing like $25,000 on my finger and I like my husband was very sweet when he designed them and he knew that I get bored easily Tasha and so I have three separate bands that make up my engagement ring and so I can pick and choose which ones I wear it's a very like clever man no. he is. yeah and so but so I only wear one at a time because I'm like I just I can't. That's too much to have on. And this is so crazy. Life's too short. Life's too short. Is that like, I mean, how? Eat the donut. Life's too short. I, oh my God. I've read that book too. I love the eat the donut book, by the way. Um, but how do you, like, do you get that from other clients? Like, is this just me that's crazy? And is like, that is a lot of damn money to walk around dangling from my body or like, do other clients feel that way too? And, and what do you say to that? Because like, I feel like that's kind of legit, right? I, yeah. I wouldn't walk around with 25 grand in my pocket. Why would I walk around with it on my finger? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's funny. Everybody's got a different, a different opinion on that. I had some clients, 25 grand not a big deal. Some clients 2,500 is a big deal to them. Right. Sure. Um, and I always tell my husband, it's so funny work, work Tasha and real life Tasha are two different things. As you get used to all the high end rings coming through, it doesn't really, you don't, you just, it's just another ring. It's very rare. I was working in a studio with like six goldsmiths there. And if somebody said, Hey, you guys should stop and take a look at this ring. You knew it was going to be crazy because you see so many of them all the time that it just becomes normal. But sure. then in real life, me going out and spending $30,000 on anything would be like, would be really intense for me. Like I sweat just thinking about it. So yeah, that's a car. That's a car. <laughs> that's a yeah, yeah. it on a house. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But what I do tell all of my clients for any purchase, because I always get this question, how much should I spend? Um, this, this whole theory of you need to spend three months salary or, or whatever is, I can't swear on your podcast, but it's bull. You can tell um, if I can swear on my podcast. Okay, Go nuts. Yeah. Um, you spend what you're comfortable spending mm -hmm. and I will make you something beautiful with whatever budget that happens to be. I always tell people your ring is the one thing that you have forever and you wear every single day. You can spend 10 grand on the caterer, 10 grand on the whatever. Um, but once that day is over, the ring is what she sees every day. So I, I personally, maybe I'm a little biased because it's what I'm into, but um, I always feel like if you're going to put money on something, that's the one that's going to last the longest and you're going to see it every day. You wear it every day, all day. But 
I don't think for anyone to, to put yourself in huge, huge debt just to buy a big fancy engagement ring. It seems kind of crazy. And I think that there's a lot of pressure to do that, to have this big, massive ring. I'm also a firm believer in when it comes to your budget, make the diamond smaller, but better clarity. Girls have it in their head that they need a carrot. I need a carrot. I need a carrot. So now you see all these girls walking around with these huge diamonds that are terrible clarity. I call them mashed potato diamonds because they look like they're really cloudy, right? So I tell all of my customers, tone, whatever your budget is, tone down the size and bump up the clarity because it's going to sparkle more and it's going to look bigger and get noticed more um, than something that's really big and looks like an ice cube. So here's my question on diamonds. <laughs> I have firm opinions mm -hmm. on them. They are very political. You will notice that the, maybe you can't see, but the stone is definitely not a diamond mm -hmm. in my There's engagement ring, yeah. which I think says a lot about where my politics fall on this. As a jeweler, as somebody who works in this area, what do you have concerns, moral reservations about the diamond trade? If so, what are those? And then, you know, how do you balance that with the fact that that's what people still want to buy? Absolutely. Absolutely, I do. Um, and I think when it comes to diamonds, most people know just enough to be dangerous, I say. Like, they know <laughs> they just skim the surface. Um, so here's the reality with diamonds. You can get diamonds almost all over the place, um, but the main countries that are producing diamonds obviously have conflict and have some issues. I mean, you can buy you can buy diamonds in Canada right now as well too, right? Yep. Um, I have some certified Canadian diamonds. There, there you go. A few diamonds that I own. Yep. There you go. So um, the reality is that in these countries that have conflict, there are still a lot of people who need jobs and who need work. And if you're in a community where your main resource is diamonds, there's not a lot of options for other places to work. So there are a bunch of really great, um, I'm not sure what the word is, I'll say programs, but I don't think it's a program. Um, people who are in the diamond industry right now are like, oh my God, Tasha, get it together. Um, so basically what this company does is they go in and they bring in an initiative, they take over the diamond mines and they ensure that all the diamonds are being mined ethically so that these people still have jobs and are being paid a fair wage um, for the country that they're in, being paid a fair wage and you don't have to worry about the, the blood diamonds and those types of things. So I get diamonds from, um, I have a few different wholesalers that I get my diamonds from. I have the option to get Canadian, I have the option to get from other countries but all of the diamonds that I get from other countries, uh, most of them are part of the Kimberly Diamond project, which ensures that they're mined ethically. So you can still get a diamond and still feel good about it. The other so, thing too, oh yeah, no, go ahead. No, 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 I was, no, go ahead. Cause what, so blood diamonds are definitely an issue, but I knew about some of those. My actually bigger issue with diamonds is the whole like cornering the market diamond cartel with the whole De Beers situation and ethical and moral issues with De Beers as a company and the fact that the, the price is hyperinflated because of how much of the market they own. So those are, <laughs> I don't know yeah. if that puts me in the just enough to be dangerous camp or if that, or where no, that no, place is. De Beers is like, if, if you're, if you're a business owner and you want to look at a great example of how to like take over your industry, <laughs> they've nailed it. They're the ones who said you have to buy an engagement ring in the first place. It, engagement rings didn't really come along until they were like, you need to buy an engagement ring and it needs to have a diamond in it. And here's where you get it from. And we're the only ones who can give it to you. Right. So they've been <laughs> really, really smart when it comes to that. They also, um, they also only release a certain amount every year so that they can keep the prices high. Um, which you see in many industries and not just in diamonds. So petroleum, I like, I don't like OPEC yeah. either, you know, <laughs> yeah. a lot of industries are doing that, right. You feel a little bit icky about it, but there's so many industries that are doing that and they're just controlling, controlling the flow so that they can keep the prices a little bit higher. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, what, what, what do you do about it? There's don't buy diamonds. About it. <laughs> the, other, that too. Um, the other option that's come out now in the last couple of years, and I'm not an expert in this because it's fairly new, 
um, is the lab grown diamonds. Um, they're kind of the new craze that's sweeping the nation. So I've worked a little bit with them. Um, yeah, so that's an option too, is to go with the lab grown diamonds. So what is the difference between a lab grown diamond and a cubic zirconia? Okay, so here's how I explain it to, to all of my customers. Okay. To be considered a diamond, I should preface this by saying I am not a jewelry appraiser. That is a whole different schooling. Fair. I'm duly noted. All of yes, all of the like I, you know. Yes, I yeah. do have to be knowledgeable in it in order to sell the diamonds. Sure. Um, but I don't actually do any of the appraisals and stuff, uh, which I do for a specific reason. But um, I have phoned some of my friends who are appraisers when the lab-grown diamonds came out and kind of asked a bunch of questions to see what you know. How do you properly explain this? To, to your customers. So in order to be considered a diamond, you have to have certain characteristics. I can't remember what the number is, like 15 characteristics or something. Lab-grown diamonds hit, I think like 14 of the 15 or something. Again, if you're in the lab-grown diamond industry, they might be shaking their heads right now at the numbers that I'm throwing out. But what happens is the science has gotten so good that they can basically scientifically create a diamond that fits the characteristics of a diamond. A cubic doesn't fit any of those characteristics. Okay. So the easiest way for me to explain it to my customers is I say, of course, it's really cold where I live. So I say, if you take two ice cube trays and you fill them with water and in one tray you put in your freezer overnight and one tray you put outside in December overnight, in the morning, you have two trays of ice no tray of ice is more ice than the other. They're both ice. The only difference is that in one situation, I manipulated the environment to create that ice. And in the other situation, that ice was formed naturally by the environment. So the difference is, is they're, they're going to react like a diamond and they're classified as a diamond, but their pricing is going to be different because they're not formed naturally. So I have had several of my engagement customers come to me with the lab grown, can we get a lab grown? And absolutely, I will do it for them. But I always wanna explain what they're kind of getting themselves into. They're very new. So what I don't know is, as you know, when we just discussed the politics of um, yeah. regular diamonds, they're always gonna maintain their value and they're gonna keep going up because they're controlling the flow, right? So if you bought a diamond, like you were saying with your rings, if you bought a diamond 10 years ago or 15, years ago, its price is going to slowly go up, just like houses usually, right? The lab grown, I don't know what's going to happen because there's no control over the flow of them. So if you're making lab grown diamonds and you say, oh, I'm going to sell you a carrot and it's going to be $2,000 for this. And then I'm down the street and I say, oh, well, she's selling hers for two grand. I'm going to sell mine for 1500 And then somebody down the street for me says, oh, well, she's doing 1500 I'm going to sell mine for 1000 It very quickly becomes a race to the bottom. So if you're okay with spending the money and getting the deal on it, I just don't know if they're going to hold their value over a long period of time, like a regular diamond would. Does that make sense? It makes they, perfect sense. They drop, fluctuate. From what your appraiser friends have said, like, can they tell the difference? So like if 10 years from now I walk in and I'm like, here's a ring, it's a diamond. And they're like, that is a lab grown. Like, can they tell? Oh yeah. The difference yeah. They're okay. to tell. Me, I have a tough time. Okay. I have a tough time telling the difference. I would have um, zero ability. So, I mean, I can't visually, I can't tell the difference between white topaz CZ and a, a diamond, like for real. Oh, I can so, show you that in 10 minutes or less. Sorry, white yeah. sapphire. Yeah. Like, like I just, I'm like, I don't, they all look white and sparkly. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so we talked a lot about diamonds. What are, for people who want to do ethical jewelry purchasing, what are the other things that don't get the press they should that are things to avoid or things that are really good choices um, in the jewelry market? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I think paying attention to where things are coming from is always important. Like you had said, where your diamonds and things are coming from. Um, where the metal is coming from. For example, um, everything that I use is technically recycled. There's a big refinery here that I send everything to. Um, so I save everything. I have a special vacuum for the shop. I'm coming here from the dusty shop right now. I say I have a special vacuum, all of my broken saw blades, my old files, everything gets saved, my old polishing vests. 
um, everything, dust, you name it, it gets saved and that gets sent into the refinery and then they refine that down and they extract all the metal and refine it and then resell it again. So technically when I'm ordering fresh metal from them, it's all recycled metal that has been recycled down over years. Um, so that's really kind of cool that you can keep recycling. What I also think is kind of cool is lots of gold gets recycled over multiple years, multiple times. So there's a very good chance that a piece of gold that you're wearing now could have been worn, a small fraction of it, could have been worn 300 years ago by somebody else. And it's just been diluted and refined and remixed so much over the years. Um, the one thing that I really think people need to pay attention to and aren't is costume jewelry and where it's coming from, particularly in children's jewelry. Okay. Um, children's jewelry is a big race to the bottom to be as cheap as possible because it's, you know, a six year old or seven year old, you don't want to spend a lot of money. The right. problem with that is, is a lot of it's being mass produced overseas and it's coming here and it's not being tested properly. There was a bunch of studies done all across North America and um, universities where they were testing the ingredients, particularly in children's jewelry. And it was full of all sorts of nasty um, cadmium and lead. And, um, and I don't think a lot of people really consider that or even ask, why is that important? Um, and I always tell they put people- put it in their mouth. They put everything in their mouth. Well, everything. And your skin is your largest organ, right? So anything touching your skin, you know, you put lotion on, that's all getting soaked into your body, right? So if you're having earrings inside your earlobes and you've got a ring touching your skin all day, every day, like it's, it's going to get absorbed in there, right? So, um, and I think you see that a lot with costume jewelry as well too, or the fashion jewelry where it's plated and it's got, in our shop we call it a mystery metal underneath where we're not really sure what it is or what to do with it. Um, and then they just coat it over top with something that looks pretty and shiny. Um, but what it's actually made out of is really not good for you. And I think that's something that people should be paying a little bit more attention to. So I think that is an amazing thing. And it kind of brings me on to one of the next things I want to talk about is I think um, one of the things that we as a society are moving towards is, or are in the midst of, I guess, is this very like disposable culture, right? We buy cheap clothes at Old Navy and then they get holes in them the second time we wear them and then we throw them away and buy new cheap clothes. And that's true kind of across the board, right? So my business partner is a ceramicist. She makes beautiful things out of ceramics and her shit lasts forever because it is handmade, crafted, like for real. But people come in and they're like, I could get a coffee cup for they two dollars at Walmart. Why would I pay thirty for yours? And she's like, I don't have a nice way to answer that. Like, just jog on, jog on. Yeah. Um, the same is true very much in your industry. We have like Amazon is awash with cheap jewelry options that are totally disposable that break after two seconds. That you know are claim to be sterling silver, but then like they cost five dollars and those two things do not go together. So what is your take on disposable jewelry culture and um, why we're there? And if you were going to make recommendations to people on where to, where it would be, if ever, okay, to use that disposable stuff versus investment in real pieces, what would your thought on that be? Yeah, I think, I mean, everything's got its place, right? I love a good five dollar sweater deal too when when the when the time comes everybody does um i think there's just a difference between you know when you're looking at something that's handcrafted like your ceramics it seems expensive at first but if it's going to last you 50 years or 60 years you're saving money right it's like i've got a friend who um sells like luxury makeup products and skin creams and a skin cream seems so expensive but when it lasts you twice as long as the cheap stuff it's like you go through the cheap stuff five times faster than the the one more expensive one it's actually cheaper to go with that route right and when you're dealing with um the more expensive kind of high-end jewelry the reality is is that piece can last for generations like i've had rings now that have made it to the second generation that I made a ring for the grandma she passed left it to her daughter when the daughter passes she's going to leave it to her daughter right so you have to put a bit of a value on that you also have to put a bit of a lot of value on the time and the craftsmanship that's 
going into it. Um, there is a big difference between something that's handcrafted and finished by hand or a sweater that's sewn by one person versus a bunch of machines in a factory somewhere that's pumping out 800 of them a day, right? And again, with your ceramics friend, people either get it or they don't. And that's half the, that's half the battle for me too, because you see that a lot in, in jewelry too, right? Is that it's, you know, I, well, I bought it for 300 bucks. Can you match that price? Well, I can't. So if that's what you want, then I'm maybe not the right person for you. There has to be that, that line, that happy medium, right? So on that note, I want to kind of talk specifically about your jewelry, because we've been talking a lot about fine jewelry and the $20,000 diamond earrings, but rhythm jewelry does not focus on the website on $20,000 diamond earrings. It has a very different feel and market. So in particular, your jewelry, a lot of it is around like the music and dance and, and movement industry. How, oh. how did that happen? Who knew that's where my life was going to go? Because I did not know that that, that, that was going to happen. So, yeah, so I guess my business now has kind of branched into two areas. I still do all of my custom. Um, I don't really advertise it. I have a lot of word of mouth clients who recommend me to other clients or whatever. So um, this in the studio here, one day I'm doing an engagement ring. The next day I'm doing ballerina pendants. It just kind of happens, whatever's on the list of things to do, kind of all over the place. Um, so a few years ago, uh, I started Rhythm, which is jewelry inspired for dancers, which sounds really random because I'm not a dancer. Um, but what wound up happening is I have some friends who are professional dancers. Um, I have one friend in particular who's taught ballet for a very long time. And every Christmas she would call and say, hey, Tasha, can I, you know, do you have any earrings in your safe? I need some for my assistants or... Some of the teachers at the studio, you know, you really should consider doing a line of jewelry for dancers because we don't have anything. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll send you some stuff. But then after like the third or fourth year of the harassment, um, she started getting really aggressive about it. Um, I started looking into it and she was totally right. So I think a lot of people hear dance and they go to five-year-old ballerinas and tutus. But if you are a, a dancer and you're in the dance community that you know that there's so much more to that. Dance is a lifestyle and there is a huge community of people who dance professionally, they teach dance, they own studios, they do dance as a living. Um, and there's really nothing out there for them. It's all kind of costume children's jewelry. So I set out to design a collection of jewelry that's inspired for dance, that's affordable but is also kind of a little bit more luxurious and a keepsake feeling that kind of represents the actual dedication and training it takes for them to do what they do. I'm also trained in the CAD, which is kind of the new way of doing jewelry. I'm trained in both, um, but I did get a certificate in CAD design and CAD is really good for logos. So Along with the engagement rings, I always got stuck doing the logo jewelry. So if you're a realtor and you reach 25 years of service and they give you a pin with a diamond on it, I was doing those. They graduate from nursing at the university and they get rings. I was doing those. So part of what Rhythm does is we offer the dance studios and the dance companies are already offering clothing merchandise with their logo on it, sweaters and pants and whatever. Um, so we offer them the opportunity to custom design their own jewelry based off of their studio um, vibe and their dance family. And it's been really, really popular um, for teachers and studio owners. But also the one thing I was really surprised was a lot of studios call me every spring and they order for their seniors when they graduate. So you have this student who's been at the studio seven days a week or six days a week for 10 years taking, because like dancers are like, they're dedicated. So you spend all this time with someone and now they're graduating and they're leaving the studio and you're not going to see them nearly as often. So they give them a piece of jewelry that kind of reminds them of the studio that they can take with them. So we, we kind of have two aspects of the business. That's, I think, I, I just think that's amazing. And I think it is so interesting that you would have thought something as huge as dance, especially for like little girls, for kids and, you know, 
that this would have already been something so totally overwhelmingly covered by like a thousand other jewelry houses. I'm sure it's going to come. Somebody's going to copy me at some point in time. Zales is going to hear this conversation and that's going to be like their next <laughs> spiky bad diamond hearts. <laughs> I, there's a few companies. I shouldn't say there isn't. There's a few companies that offer one or two pieces. And I think I found one other company that has like more than one or two pieces, but their style of jewelry is very different than our style of jewelry. Um, yeah, I was really surprised that there was not a lot out there. And it's a niche market for sure. And they, you know, in business, it's always good to hit a niche market, but this niche market is very, very large. Like it's well, a very large group of people. Because I noticed you do, you do dance, you do all the flavors of dance up to and including Broadway stuff. And then you also do cheer, which again, I'm in, I'm in Texas. Believe me, the cheer market, like yeah. if you had a, a, something that went on a bow, like forget about it, right? Like, it's be the new must-have accessory. Yeah. But, like, the boat, my husband, we were at a hotel once, and a cheer competition was happening at the hotel. My husband, bless him, is English and was unaware that Americans are crazy about cheer. He thought bringing it on was just like a movie, and I was like, oh, sorry, honey. He was like, why are there all these young girls dressed like prostitutes with giant bows in their hair? like yeah this is a cheer competition honey he was like so they're naked with all the makeup I know it's wild right and you know cheer is not as big in Canada but it's definitely over the last few years it's definitely started it's kind of like the craze not a craze I'm sure um cheer coaches right now are shaking their heads at me but it was never super super popular in Canada but the last few years it's become more and more popular. And I'm not a dancer or a cheerleader. I always tell people with all, they know how many hours they've spent learning to cheer and learning to dance. Doesn't leave a lot of time for other things. Um, that's me, but with jewelry making. Doesn't leave a lot of time for other things. So what I do is I get a lot of feedback from the dance community and the cheer community. The reason why I expanded into cheer is because cheerleaders kept messaging me saying, I want something for cheer. Do you have anything for cheer? Can we have something for cheer? So I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll do a couple of cheer pieces. And then that's the plan is to slowly start um, expanding into the different genres, like tap dance. I have a little tap shoe. It's just a little tap shoe. And it's it sells like crazy. And tap dancers, if I'm set up at an expo, um, most of the tap dancers, they don't even they don't even ask how much things cost. They're just like, oh my God, you have something for a tap dancer? Everything's for ballerinas. I'll take it. It's like they have they have nothing. And the men who dance have even less because everything is designed for five-year-old ballerinas, right? There's not much representing the other genres. So we're slowly trying to expand and represent all the other genres, which takes time, but we'll get there eventually. I absolutely love it. I cannot wait um, for when you um, bring out your Bollywood line because, like, I feel like that, again, like, that is an ongoing trend. It's amazing. It's one of my favorite dance trends at the moment. And again, there's no Western anything that like reflects that trend at all. So that's going to be, I, I love your jewelry. I think it's super cool. I'm not a dancer. So I like the other pieces. The pearls are definitely a big fan of that. We have a lot of pieces that aren't dance specific. They're, they're marketed towards dancers and they're designed off of dance, but we do have a lot of pieces that are you don't have to be a dancer to wear them I just launched a collection in November with nappy tabs um, and they're quite famous in the dance community and just about every piece we did like one or two pieces that are very specific dancers um, but most of their pieces like this is one of their pieces so you can I, I wear mine every day and I'm not a dancer so we try to um, I try to make it a bit more general if I can too right yeah and I, like I said, there are plenty, there's plenty of ways for me to spend money on your website. Please do not get me wrong on that at all. Like it's gorgeous and I love a ton of it in, and I am in no way a dancer. My eldest son believes that he is a dancer, but really he just likes to wear sparkly pants and shake his booty. So I'm not sure that that counts. Oh, it counts. He's, he's five. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we showed him Billy Elliot and he was like, all over what? it. Oh, you got to put that kid in dance classes, I think. Oh, I know. He has dance classes, but it's like, 
So the um, the ballet in Austin offers free dance co ballet classes for boys because they have such a shortage. But it's like an hour one way drive to get oh, yeah. in there. Yeah. So I'm like, ah, we're gonna make sure that you're like really want to do this before mommy makes it a pain in her butt. Like I think that's where we're at. Um, but I I love that like it seems like su it's such a great story because it feels like it would be one of those obvious niches. And I love when you hear like those entrepreneur business stories where you're like somebody says, and then I invented such and so, and you're like, why did not everybody else have already thought of that before? And I just think that it's so, I think that's so great. Um, and I think it's fantastic. Yeah. So I have to ask of all the pieces you've made, what is your favorite piece and what piece out of my whole career? <laughs> if you can think of that, if not, I'll let you do in like the last 12 months. Oh, gosh. Um, the favorite that I've made. Um, well, I have a few pieces. I learned a long time ago that jewelry isn't just jewelry isn't jewelry. It sounds weird, but jewelry is just not jewelry. Jewelry is about telling a story. If I come to your house and I say, bring me your jewelry box and put it on the kitchen table and show me everything you have in it, you're not going to be like, oh, this is my platinum ring with a blood and give me all the specs. You're going to say things like you just told me, my husband bought me these and he didn't, he knew that I like different choices. So he bought me three different kinds or there's always a, a story or something you're trying to tell. So for me, it's mostly been a lot of the stories that come with the pieces that I've made over the years, whether they're really strange um, or really like sentimental and touching like some of the engagement ring stories I've had um probably this collection that I designed in November has been one of the um most fun thing and interesting things because the people that I designed with are to me the ultimate collaborators so collaborating with them to design something um no pressure <laughs> <laughs> lots of pressure um but that was really interesting and really fun to do too um and then I've had some really um sweet stories of re you know remaking things like I had a friend okay you've seen the last year I had a friend whose grandma passed away and when they were um dividing up her jewelry of course she's the granddaughter so the daughters take things and her grandma had this one ring do you remember those they're really popular right now too they're the black Alaskan rings and they've got like they're a black stone and it's like a big point oh diamond. yeah really mm -hmm. popular in the 70s and 80s um, and they go from like knuckle to knuckle. So her grandma wore one of those all the time. Um, and she really wanted it. But of course, when her grandma passed, she they went to one of the aunties or whatever. So she brought me this old photo of her, my friends like in her 40s, of on her like fifth birthday with the birthday cake. And it's all, like, you know, like a bent up photo and her grandma's sitting beside her smoking, right? Because when we were kids, they would just smoke at the kitchen table. Right. So her grandma's sitting beside her beside the birthday cake and she's little and she's blowing out the candles and her grandma's got her hand on the table with a cigarette and you can see the ring it was a little blurry, but that was the best shot she had of the ring. So I took that picture and we duplicated that ring exactly to what her grandma had. And then when I gave it to her, she started to cry. And so just like, I think for me, just being a part of people's stories, even if it's just a small part, being a part of engagements or, um, I've in during COVID, I did a lot of remounts. I think people were bored and they were at home going through their jewelry boxes. So, they were bringing all their broken chains and repairs and um, melting it down and making it into something new. So sometimes being able to take um, old pieces that people have that mean something to them and making it into something new that they're going to be able to wear all the time. It's one of my favorite things to do. So what if somebody wants to order a custom piece from you, what makes somebody a great client? Like what should they come in ready with? What kind of questions should they be asking? What kind of budget should they have? Like, what makes you be like, oh, yes, you are exactly the kind of client I like to work with. Thank you for not sucking today. I tend to work backwards. I always have. I'm not sure why. But I um, tend to get a rough budget from them. So let's say we're doing an engagement ring. Um, I can do an engagement, let's say it's a solitaire ring, one diamond with a band. I can make that ring for $2,000 or $250,000 just by switching that stone out, right? So I always tell my customers to come to me with a rough budget 
and then I'll give them price points a little bit below budget, right on budget, a little bit above budget, so they can kind of figure out where they want to be and see the difference. Um, and then pictures, even if it's not exactly what you want, but something that at least narrows it down. Otherwise, it's like walking into a car dealership saying, I'd like to buy a car. Well, do you want a four door? Do you want something sporty? Do you want a minivan? Like at least narrow it down a little bit. Um, and the main thing I find, especially with engagement rings and brides, is I find sometimes they tend to over detail everything. They pay attention to the tiniest little thing that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Like it's you're talking like a quarter of a millimeter or they, they really overanalyze and they almost they almost kind of suck the fun out of the process for them by overanalyzing every tiny little detail. Um, don't get me wrong, engagement rings you have to be perfectly exact on them, but sometimes I find brides get too stressed out about the little details. I, I get that because ultimately like there's only so much anybody's going to see, right? Like day ending and why. And so like I have seen my, when my sister did her engagement ring, she and I are very different in our preferences. She was one of those, like, she wanted like the curly Q heart thing under the diamond setting. And then she also wanted the da da da. And I was like, stop, like I'm going to wear this damn thing the rest of your life, you know what? Nobody is ever going to freaking notice all of that shit. Like <laughs> they're going to notice that there is a solitaire diamond of a certain size and poor quality on your finger. And that's going to be the extent. And like, I'm razzing my sister, but like, she doesn't have a huge budget. And so like, you know, they did the best they could, but it is definitely like, I hear what you're saying. Like she was definitely like, and then what if it had like little bitty hearts all around it? I was like, ew, stop, stop. Yeah. I'm sorry, lots of times brides, not all the time, but they get so caught up in the little details and they get very stressed out about the spacing and the, and it's like, I'm also, I've done this a lot longer than you have. So at some point in time, trust me a little bit. I'm not, I would never sell you something ugly ever. Um, so trust me a little bit on the structure and how things are going to look. I find sometimes they get a little over involved in some of the little details or too stressed out about it maybe. Um, and I do find a lot of times they want to just keep adding more stuff and sometimes sometimes less or more, more. Yeah. or little details here that people aren't going to notice or yeah yeah I love it I cannot believe that we're almost out of time um, because this has been amazing so <laughs> what have I not asked you that I should have asked you um I think you've covered everything you're a great interviewer I think you covered everything <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we will have the link to your website and everybody can go and spend all their money with you. I know that I have three things sitting in my shopping cart right now that um, I'll be checking out later. <laughs> oh, lovely. Because <laughs> um, your stuff is is great and, and I love it. So thank you so much um, for your time. And this has been, I've learned a lot and I hope that other people have too. Thank you. This has been awesome. Well, thanks for having me. You've been listening to, Hey, I want your job. For more information on how you can get your own awesome job, visit ONH Consulting at www.onhconsulting.com. We offer incredible resumes, no nonsense career advice, and real world tips for landing a job in today's market. Check us out on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Insta for more insider information. Soon, you'll be hearing us say, I'm Michelle Olivier, and hey, I want your job. <laughs>